Shakespeare's King Lear of the First Folio, together with its earlier quarto edition Q1 in 1608, harbors an unresolved, yet unanswered question. Which anonymous author might have written, The True Chronicle History of King Lear? A play, registered for printing in 1594, but allowed to be printed only eleven years later in 1605, after it was re-registered again. Based on comparative text analysis, there can be not the shadow of a doubt, that the Q1 Lear version must have relied on the early King Lear play of 1594. The author of Lear expanded original elements of King Lear. He adopted the most important common scenes between Lear and Perilous and changed the name Perilous to Kent. It seems difficult, or even absurd and unreasonable, to imagine, that Shakespeare would have borrowed such an amount of essential ideas and similarities from a less important contemporary author. Consider Up to now, there is no consensus of scholarly opinion, on the authorship of the early play of King Lear, from 1594. The play is variously attributed to Thomas Kidd, Michael Drayton, George Peel, Thomas Lodge, Anthony Munday, and Shakespeare himself. It remains a sore point and peculiar irony of literary history that the greatest poet genius and dramatist of its time, isn't even considered a candidate of the early Lear play. With common sense, only a single truth and logic, seems tenable and acceptable. The compositions of both Lear plays must have, and can only have, emerged from the same, singular, brain. This video summarizes plausible arguments. Why this, singular, brain must have belonged to Christopher Marlowe. Sidney Lee came to the remarkable verdict at the beginning of the 20th century. Marlowe could not be the author of Lear, his qualities were above the quality of this text, while the other candidates did not exude Shakespeare's ingenious qualities. Can you imagine, that Sidney Lee explicitly wrote? Marlowe's genius entitles him to a better fate. It is fatuous, to associate his name with an effort, which at no point rises to any fullness of poetic utterance. The characteristic merits of Lodge, Kidd, Peel, or Green are far inferior to those of Marlowe. They walk on the lower slopes of the Elizabethan Parnassus. Their dramatic work lacks for the most part indubitable marks of exalted individuality. And to have withheld all key to the dramatist's name from the title page. The absence of the author's name or his initials suggest that he never merged from a position of obscurity. Sidney Lee's arguments should have been enough to identify in Marlowe, the author of the early King Lear play in 1594. His naming or permission to print would have been unthinkable in 1594, so shortly after his shameful departure. He needed exactly that position of obscurity. For example, King Lear, Act 2. Cornwall. Is Cornwall welcome to your excellency? Goneril. As welcome, as Leander was, to Hero. Or brave Aeneas, to the Carthage Queen.
so and more welcome, is your grace, to me. Who other, than Marlowe in 1594, would have referred to, even two, of his very recent own works, Hero and Leander and Dido, Queen of Carthage. The description and naming of the eloquent Berylus. Pleasing orator. Thy hopeful speeches cannot have been chosen unintentionally. Note. Perilous in Lear became the Earl of Kent, in the first folio Lear. Perilous the endangered. The one in danger. Perilous response to Lear's desire to complain about their both losses seems full of innuendos. Lear. Thou pleasing orator unto me in woe. Cease to beguile me with thy hopeful speeches. Oh, join with me, and think of naught but crosses. And then we will lament the other's losses. Perilous. Why say the worst, the worst can be but death. And death is better than fought o despair. Then hazard death, which may convert to life. Banish despair, which brings a thousand deaths. Is it conceivable, in 1594, that a hazard death of banished, perilous, converted, back, to life, does not relate, biographically, to the actual fateful situation of its author of the Lear play? similar to other, thematically corresponding, quarto plays, but much earlier, than corresponding later plays in the first folio. In the case of King Lear, the simple explanation could not be taken into consideration, that the folio version by the same author clearly represented further developments, necessarily under a new pen or pseudo name. King Lear first appeared as Quarto I, in 1608 and as Quarto II, in 1619, their folio edition is a heavily edited version of Q2. The differences between Q1, Q2, and FF1 are considerable. Q1 contains 285 lines, that do not appear in FF1, FF1 again contains about 100 lines, that do not appear in Q1. At least 1000 individual words were changed between Q1 and the folio, and each text has different punctuation. Half of the lines of verse in the first folio are either written in prose or divided differently, compared to Q1. The various impressive alterations within the Lear texts could only have been made by an author, who was extremely familiar with the text and play. Actually only by the author himself. In King Lear, the noble and loyal Earl of Kent, is cast out by the king. He returns to the court with a different appearance and under a false name and continues to serve the king, without revealing his new identity. We can assume, that the true Shakespeare knew, what it meant, to live with a false, borrowed identity. In Act 1, Scene 4, the author condensed this autobiographical experience and perils, with the Earl of Kent, whose name in King Lear was still perilous, with extraordinary authenticity in numerous statements. It fits perfectly with Marlowe's biography. He must give his character an artificial appearance. Conceal his being. He had to take refuge in a foreign language that distorted his speech. 
but as will I other accents borrow, that can my speech diffuse. He must give his character an artificial appearance, cover up his being. Two, I raised my likeness. He must serve where he is put. Three, banished Kent, canst serve where thou dost stand condemned. He must confess that he is a little, as he appears. For I do profess to be no less than I seem. He lives best with someone who is clever, but speaks little. 5. To converse with him, that is wise, and says little. He could not argue against unwise decisions, because he had no choice. 6. Fear judgment to fight, when I cannot choose. He should not get involved in, ecclesiastical, matters. Of the Saviour, Jesus Christ. 7. And to eat no fish. It is almost impossible, to imagine someone, who could invent all of this, with no experience in matters of loss of identity and pretending to be a foreign identity. Doesn't that fit most authentically to Marlowe's fateful autobiography? What could have been the motive of the true author of King Lear, to remodel around 1605-1606 the early comedy King Lear from 1594, to such a dark and sorrowful tragedy as Quarter One of King Lear, and to integrate the new, independent subplot with the remarkable figures of Edgar and Tom of Bedlam? Quarter One of King Lear seems to have arisen during a phase of deep depression a melancholy phase that becomes understandable, given the assumed living circumstances of Marlowe. In 1605 he was 41 years old, was living under a false name and identity, in contact with his family and parents in Canterbury. Both parents died in quick succession in 1605, Father John in February, Mother Catherine in July 1605. The parallel story in King Lear of the unfortunate life of Edgar can by no means be pure fiction. The noble and loyal Edgar had to abandon his true identity and live on under a false identity, as Tom of Bedlam, his true identity, completely analogous to Marlowe, will never be disclosed. Edgar's very first appearance in the play allegorically, points to his life catastrophe as well as to his deep depression. Edgar undoubtedly represents the autobiographical blueprint of its true author. In many of Shakespeare's plays, but especially in King Lear, the author's supposed lack of any autobiographical references to the content of the play, must be recognized as a fatal mistake in literary studies. Shakespeare Academe at no time was able to question the authorship of William Shakespeare from Stratford and to recognize the true genius of poetry in the pseudonym Shakespeare, although the King Lear subplot of the unfortunate life of Edgar suggests this, in every one of its lines. The autobiographical interpretation of Edgar in King Lear is imperative. The metaphorical multiple levels correspond to the blueprint of the tragedy of Marlowe's own life and destiny. The true author genius of King Lear, who developed the person of Edgar, must have endured the physical and psychological strains of his own loss of identity, of his permanent banishment, and persecution himself, to be able to depict his own fate based on Edgar's situation and to describe it, in such an authentic artistic manner. Just listen and imagine the following authentic monologue of Edgar's continuously threatened, specific, life situations. I heard myself proclaimed. And by the happy hollow of a tree escaped the hunt. No port is free, no place that guard and most unusual vigilance does not attend my taking. Whiles I may escape, I will preserve myself. And am bethought, to take the basest and most poorest shape. That ever penury, in contempt of man, brought near to beast. My face I'll grime with filth. Blanket my loins, elf all my hair in knots. 
and with presented nakedness, outface the winds and persecutions of the sky. The country gives me proof and precedent of bedlam beggars, who, with roaring voices, strike in their numbed and mortified bare arms. Pins, wooden bricks, nails, sprigs of rosemary. And with this horrible object, from low farms, poor pelting villages, sheep coats, and mills. Sometime with lunatic bands, sometime with prayers. Enforce their charity. Port Early Good. Port Om. That's something yet, Edgar I. Nothing am. Also from the following authentical monologue of Edgar's situation, Act 3, Scene 4, it becomes clear that his inner exile in England, with a manhunt for his person might have granted seven years. But mice and rats, and such small deer have been Tom's food for seven long year. Who gives anything to poor Tom? Whom the foul fiend has led through fire and through flame, through sword and whirlpool, over bog and quagmire, that has laid knives under his pillow and halters in his pew, set ratspan by his porridge, made him proud of heart, to ride on a bay trotting horse over four inched bridges, to course his own shadow for a traitor. What a vivid and plastic, authentic, depiction of Edgar's life situation. Note, King Lear the only one of Shakespeare's major tragedies that has a subplot, whose protagonist, Lear, confronts a complimentary double disguise, Edgar's, Kent, where madness, real or feigned, mirrors autobiographically the, author's invention of his own life, in multiple facets. The role Edgar plays in the middle of King Lear's tragedy must be, and can only be, understood, if you see it as an, autobiographic embodiment of its true author's self-alienation and negation, expressed in such sentences, as Edgar I nothing am. In nothing am I changed, but in my garments. No, my name is lost. Indicating that Shakespeare was a pen name of its true author. The mysteries of the inventions of the roles of Edgar, Kent, Tom of Bedlam, Edward the Bastard etc. only becomes understandable, when we look more closely at Marlowe's autobiography and destiny. In the book The Complete Angler, or, The Contemplative Man's Recreation in 1653 of Isaac Walton, whose life is largely in the dark. We read and learn, oddly enough, that at the author's request, William Bass composed a poetical song of Tom of Bedlam. Both, the unidentifiable contemporary poet William Bass, W.B. No family background or date of birth is known. As well as Shakespeare, could not possibly have devised the figure of Tom of Bedlam independently of each other. Weighty arguments, click link above, suggest, that Bass and Shakespeare represent pen names of the same, identical, author. The cliffs, on the west side of Dover, are now called, the Shakespeare Cliffs. The author of King Lear must have known the Dover region well. There is no known source, that proves, that Shakespeare from Stratford had local knowledge of this region and the coast, and it is still inconceivable to this day, how he could have such nostalgic associations to this place. The situation is completely different with Marlowe, his maternal family, mother Catherine Arthur and grandfather William Arthur, came from Dover. One can safely assume. That young Marlowe in his youth often walked from Canterbury to nearby Dover, with his mother.
in Act 4 Scene 1, Edgar explains Gloucester, that he is familiar with the region of Dover, and the cliffs. The cliffs, in King Lear, are described authentically, the look at them down, the crows standing in the wind, the surf, that can be heard from below, the tiny fishermen in the depths, etc. Edgar even mentions a man who, under danger, harvested the aromatic plant Sampire from the cliffs, which grows on the steep cliffs of the coast, near Dover. Only a local person could report about it, so authentically. Overall, this description leaves little doubt, that the author of Lear must have known the Kent region, between Canterbury and Dover, well. The landscape described, can be related to Marlowe's homeland, Kent, but not to Shakespeare's home region Stratford. Come on, sir, here is the place. Stand still. How fearful and is it is to cast one's eyes so low. The crows and chaffs, that wing the midway air, show scarce so gross as beetles. Halfway down hangs one, that gathers sampire, dreadful trade. Methinks, he seems no bigger than his head. The fishermen, that walked upon the beach, appear like mice, and yon tall anchoring bark, diminished to her cock, her cock, a boy almost too small for sight. The murmuring surge, that on the unnumbered idle pebble chafes, cannot be heard so high. I will look no more, lest my brain turn, and the deficient sight topple down headlong. Exiled by Lear, Kent assumes disguise, to serve the master, who has banished him. He retains that disguise, however, beyond the point, where it would appear to be necessary. Astonishingly, the true author of King Lear, gives us the explanation to this fact in the following dialogue between Cordelia and Kent's confession. Be better suited. These weeds, are memories of those worser hours, I prithee, put them off. Pardon me, dear madam. Yet, to be known, shortens my main intent. My boon, I make it, that you know me not. Until time and I, think meet. The remarkable action of several figures of the play, who consistently present themselves, by employing the use of disguises, that is, stressing their losses of identity and fate, are designed to express complementary autobiographic intentions of the true author of King Lear. a. Its physical self-preservation. b. The conscious intention of the author's fundamental secret, to remain unknown, by using several artistic identities. Marlowe was called, Merlin during his student days in Cambridge. Robert Greene's contemporary description of Marlowe from 1588 mentions, Tamerlan the main character in Marlowe's drama, in a clear context, with Merlin. Daring God out of heaven with that atheist, Tamburlin, or blaspheming with the mad priest of the sun. Such mad and scoffing poets that have prophetical spirits as bred of Merlin's race. If there be any in England that's at the end of scholarism in an English blank verse, I think either it is the humour of a novice that thickles them.
In King Lear, Act 3, Scene 2, the fool quotes a prophecy of Merlin for better times to come, whereby the illusion of the legendary wizard is clearly ambiguous, after Merlin has listed and denounced all the present grievances, he prophesies. If all these grievances, from which he had to suffer, had been overcome, one would walk upright again, with two legs, a time, that he would never live to see. Then comes the time, who lives to see it. That, going, shall be used, with feet. This prophecy, Merlin shall make. For, I live, before his time. At the very beginning of the play, King Lear acknowledges the closeness of Tamburlne to his heart, by mentioning a barbarous Scythian. This cannot have been written without some subtle meaning. The Scythian should be close to his heart, and find the same consolation and compassion, as his former daughter. Shall to my bosom be as well neighbored, pitied, and relieved as thou, my sometime daughter. The barbarous Scythian undoubtedly refers to Tamburlne, Marlowe's main character of the same name, which was a great success on the London stage. Assuming, that Marlowe was the author of King Lear, this speculation may be allowed, this passage can only be understood as an allegoric unveiling of the author's fate, for him his composition of Tamburlne had the same inner status, the same value, as his family and daughter.